Piat castles have been a popular destination for over 100 years. These unique structures have become a private, family-owned museum that interprets over 200 years of history of the Ohio land and Ohio people. There's nothing else like it. I mean, there's very few places like this in the United States. And to have this kind of a resource that is within a 45 minute drive of Columbus, which is with a half hour drive of Springfield, an hour of the major metropolitan places like Dayton, Cincinnati, and so forth, you know, you really can't put any sort of uh, measurement on that, on what kind of value that is. The th important thing I think to understand about the castles is that it was a family home built on land that had been owned by this family already for generations. So the castles are basically seven generations on one piece of land. Five of those generations lived in this house. And for the first generation, it was their home. But for all the later generations, it was not only their home, it was also a museum. The castles are wonderful because they're so grown out of the land. The family had a sawmill. Uh, and produced most of the, the lumber uh, for the castles on the land. Without the, the limestone quarry on the land, I doubt if they would have been limestone buildings uh, or nearly as grand as they are. The accessibility of the materials uh, really made the difference for the family, I think, because they weren't wealthy monetarily. They had the land uh, and the resources of the land uh, that made them possible. The original farm was 1,700 acres, and it was a very diversified farm, and in some ways a gentleman's farm. Uh, Benjamin Piat had many people who worked for him. He also operated a grist mill and a sawmill. He had a distillery. He had a huge orchard, you know, lots of types of cattle, and you know, lots of individuals, actually, who lived on the land and worked here. And then the next generation who actually built this house transformed that into a family farm. So for the next several generations, it was primarily farmed by family members with an occasional hired laborer. Benjamin's son, Abram, who had grown up on this land, built the Makachik House between the years 1864 and 1871. He then lived here until 1908 when he died. He was the second generation on the land, but the first generation to live in the house. The second generation to live in this house, uh, William McCoy Piat, was an inventor of farm machinery. And by the time he lived here, he was an older man who had already you know, struggled to make money with inventions. He was pretty successful with inventing things, but not at all successful in having them manufactured. He loved to play with machinery, and he just loved inventing things. We have found uh, 19, I believe, patents in the archives that he obtained for mostly farm machinery, 18 of them for horse-drawn machinery, and the last one had a motor. It's just exciting to me to think that we're able to document these old things that were done and written in a day that computers were not even conceived of and we are recording them on technology that will be out of date next month, I suppose, but at least we're giving it a try. So many times today you read newspaper articles about how you must get rid of everything and simplify your life, but we're so glad that these people didn't follow that. They saved almost everything. For instance, we cataloged a chewing gum wrapper, and I couldn't understand that until Margaret told us that her father once sold chewing gum, and that this wrapper represented his business for a while. With the rise of automobiles and new roads, and a need to fund his inventions, William McCoy Piat created a little museum in one room of the Piat house. 100 years later, the Piat family is still welcoming people into their lives. To begin with, which was very much the trend in other museums, the stories that were told were the military stories. So William would talk about his father, the Civil War general, and his grandfather who'd been in the Revolution, and show the objects from the past. 
We probably spend more time trying to help visitors think about their own family histories and how does this house symbolize what you choose to remember, what you choose to keep, what you just as soon forget, you know, what's not important to you any longer. We, in some ways, have a more of a social history approach, even though we still show the same objects. People have been coming here for generations, and they expect to see the same thing when they come back again. But at the same time, you want to find a way to attract new visitors and make the space uh, viable and interesting to a generation that's used to a very different kind of visual and intellectual input than a previous generation had. So what we've been trying to do is create a series of temporary exhibits and mobile exhibits that can really draw in a new aesthetic and a new way of conveying information. The Makachik Foundation for the Humanities funds much of the educational programming at the Piat Castles. Castle camps in the summer and after school programs in the fall and spring bring history to life for many kids. All of our youth programs include interactive questioning, hands-on activities, and when possible, some type of drama or arts related aspect. If a house represents a family and you're exploring this house to think about life, I want people to look at this as a case study, but to walk away and think about themselves. That's a real big difference than what was happening here a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, they were really showing things and explaining what they were. And we still do that, but we in some ways try to make it more about the visitor and less about us. What Kate and Margaret have done is they have made it interactive. You actually have hands-on experiences here. When you think of Edgar Allan Poe, you think of gothic stories. You think of powerful, emotional, like the fall of the House of Usher. When you look at Makochik, you can envision the fall of the House of Usher. And so he's a perfect choice to read to kids, again, to immerse them in an environment where this kind of story was written. It's exciting to continue that trend of moving the historic house museum construct, which is well established, into a new venue and using it for public programming and using it for education in arts and in humanities and literacy um, and doing that online and here and in schools is a really exciting way to expand our reach. I hope we can keep them open for the public. Every year it becomes a little more difficult. We have the nonprofit side that can help us with programming and educational things, but not with anything physical for the buildings. Basically, the, my main goal is to keep the buildings weather tight uh, is the first step, and that is pretty much all I can do most of the time. There are an endless list of things that the buildings could use. I know that the visitors who come here really love it if I tell them stories about being little here, and if I show them the dust channels that were designed so people could clean the stairs better, but then I tell how I raced cars down them. You know, they really like those stories. I'm interested in people looking at the past so they can think about the present. The people who lived in this house were not necessarily thinking about the future. You know, they were thinking about how they wanted their life to be. It's been a wonderful place to grow up, and it's an exciting place to be an adult, and I'm looking forward to where it goes in the future. It's been a good hundred years. We'll see what happens next.